okay let's get started so uh, before i start i just wanted to make a few announcements uh, the first announcement is on friday i am traveling to north carolina state university so there will be no class on friday but i am going to upload the video for the class at some point of time during the during this week so before i leave i'll record a lecture and i'll upload it on, on youtube for friday's lecture and you can watch it uh, at a later time so that's announcement number 1 no class on friday second announcement i know a lot of you have uh, not a lot but a cup of a couple of you have sent me an email about the codes and you know sometimes one of the issues with having a case study type assignment is question 1 feeds into question 2 question 2 feeds into question 3 and so if you made a mistake in question 2 it automatically screws up the answer for question 3 So I'm trying to change assignment two and three so that so that you have as minimal problem as possible. So if you made a mistake in question two, it shouldn't translate into a mistake in question three. So it'll take me some time to get that done, but I'm I'm going to put in my effort to to try to do that so that you are able to solve question two and three without sorry uh, assignment two and three. without getting into this issue that if your question 1 is solved incorrectly uh you have trouble in question 2 and 3 so i'll address that uh, and then i'll reupload the assignment but for now at least the assignment is already uploaded so you can take a look and see if there are any issues that you encounter while solving the assignment and uh, if there are any issues just let me know so that i can address those as well when i'm revising my revising assignment 2 and 3 um uh, now any questions any conceptual questions in assignment 2 uh, uh sorry assignment 1 so if you have a conceptual question i'll cover it in the on the board right now uh if you have coding questions then we'll have to set up a time to meet at some point of time during the week um so send me an email if you need to meet me but if you have a conceptual questions this is a good time to ask Yes. Well, I have a question but yes. I Yes. I don't know if it's a conceptual <coughs> question or not but uh, Go ahead. It's uh, related to the probability thing. Yes. So that uh, the, the matrix we you know that the uh, formula is this that each kernel is a probability of a certain case. Right. And calculating those probabilities for a certain node. Yes. Yes. It's kind of a right. So I have put in the uh, the way to calculate it in the uh, discussion forum right before this class. Okay. So like literally 15 minutes ago I put it put that information in there. Okay. Uh, in the discussion forum so if you go and check your discussion forum you will have that information okay. there. Any other question? Yeah the second yeah question number 2 Yeah that's what his question was about Um uh, and and also submitting this assignment how uh how we, what exactly are are we submitting like of course the code your matlab codes and figures <coughs> figures in a word file Okay because like the uh So what we how we will check it how we will grade it is we'll go through your assignment solution which will be a word file or or just your handwritten stuff okay. along with uh, figures okay. but it has to be a single word file like don't don't submit like 20 figures yeah. in your assignment solution because then we wouldn't be able to match okay. which is which so so you do that and then if your figure looks incorrect i'm going to go back to your assign uh, to back to your code and then i'm going to check where exactly you went wrong in the code so that's how we will do the grading i was thinking on like uh, publishing using the publish feature of matlab that's perfectly fine too yeah because that yeah. will contain the code exactly exactly yeah it. if you can do that that will be amazing yeah and yeah. whatever part i have written on paper i will just concat it in a paper yes paper. yes that will be great if you can do that that's amazing that's the best case solution yeah. but i'm not sure if others would be able to do that or not i know yeah 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 but 
typically people don't do that. Yeah. But if you can do it, that will be, if you make my life easy, I'll make your life easy, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, the problem here is what, where the problem happens when I'm grading coding-based assignments. So codes are, you submit the codes as M file, then I have to download the M file, then I have to open it in MATLAB. That opening procedure is like, I don't know, 20 minutes long, because the MATLAB has to load up all the files before it opens the code. And then I have to go through each and every line of the code and figure out where you did, where you made a mistake. So that takes a long time, and that's what I want to avoid by looking at the figures first, and then if figures look okay, then it's fine. If figures are incorrect, then it means that something in your code has gone wrong, and so I'll have to go back and check that. Yeah. One figure, right? Yes. If you didn't post that, so how we have to upload that figure? So if you look at the question, the figure that I'm expecting to see is already part of the question. Like that is what you should be seeing, where you have one of the blue line that is that is not going to infinity, but there is a red line that is sort of going to infinity, in the compromised case. Okay. Do you do you have that in your assignment? No? I didn't get that part. Um, in problem three, yes. uh, my question is, we really get, get each time one fig, uh, figure, right, if the detection happens. Right. Uh, so how we should upload that? So I think in problem three, the question is, uh, you have to run the code for 5,000 time steps for the, uncomprom for the compromised case. And what you will see is that the Q sum is going to go, the Q sum score is going to become very high. So you don't have to do any detection because detection means that you are just stopping the process at some specific time slot when the Q sum score exceeds the threshold. So we are not asking you to go all the way to exceeding, like we are not asking you to stop the process at the threshold, we are asking you to plot it all the way to 5,000 time steps or 500 time steps, whatever that number is. Okay. I, I think I think uh, he means that if we, you know, when we have like ten samples for the uncompromised and thirty samples for the compromised system, mm -hmm. that's a total of forty uh, figures. Because each iteration, it's it's plotting uh, a figure with where the time was exceeded, yeah. and it's plotting every like it's pausing for two seconds and then. Oh, uh, no, you don't, you're not going to, well, uh, no, <laughs> there are, it's a lot of plots. Uh, no, 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 you don't have to g provide so many plots. Uh, let me go back and check the assignment and then I'll tell you exactly what plots I'm looking for in that assignment. And the number of samples for, for, the, for the uncompromised yes. system, it's only 10. And, and, uh, <coughs> Mm -hmm. So, uh, if the required, in, in the last part, if the required uh, false alarm rate is below 0.1, mm -hmm. well, it's zero because it's only 10 samples. It's right. Zero. So, you have to increase the number of samples. You have to play around with some of these numbers too. So, we can change the number? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, of course. Okay. Of course. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those numbers are given only for illustrative purposes. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, you go and change the number. and. Okay with whatever intuition you have developed, change the number and make sure yeah, that, yeah. yeah. The hope is that you will understand the trade-offs when you are making in, uh, if you change the numbers, you will understand the trade-offs of how quickly you can detect, how many data samples you need and all that stuff. Of course, it's a very simple problem, but illustrative of how a complex system would also work, like a small component of a complex system would work. Any other question? Okay, so uh, so let's uh, begin with today's lecture. So the goal today is to talk about active detection scheme. Which is called dynamic watermarking. And the idea in dynamic watermarking is as follows. So we have a 
let me remind you of that figure. So we have an actuator. We have a plant. We have a sensor. And there is a communication channel. And then we have a controller. <coughs> so within this controller, there will be a lot of blocks like estimator, controller, and all that stuff. But this is what a usual system would look like. So this would be my UT. This is my XT. This would be my ZT. Uh, and this would be my UT. Let me call it YT. Okay. So now when you look at this particular plant, uh, this, this whole system, so let's give, give you a concrete example. So if you look at this room, the plant is actually this room itself along with the air conditioning system and the thermostat sensor, thermostat with temperature sensor there. Thermostat is the controller. You have a temperature sensor that feeds into the thermostat. And then you have an actuator, which is the air conditioning system that pumps certain amount of cold air into the plant. Plant is basically this room here. <clears throat> and then the plant itself, the room itself has some dynamics, some temperature dynamics that depends on how many people are inside the room and how much cold air is being injected and all that stuff. Now, in the previous uh, set of lectures, and that's part of your assignment one, what we are doing is we don't really change any of these, these things. We, we are not changing the control strategy. We are not changing the actuator, plant, and sensor. And we are trying to look at the data that is coming out, which is look at this y of t. And then we are trying to detect whether there is an attack ongoing on the system or not. OK? So I'm observing the system. I'm observing the temperature data. And I'm trying to figure out if, if the system is getting attacked or not. Now, the problem with that particular, now how are we detecting whether it's uh, getting attacked or not? I'm looking at the distribution of y1, y2, and so on. And I'm checking whether the distribution is as expected or not. Right? That's what the, uh, what is that? The log likelihood uh, test is able to tell you. So what log likelihood test is telling you is you have a sequence of observations. And you want to check whether that sequence of observations is coming from a specific distribution that you know or not. OK, that's what log likelihood does. Now the problem is as follows. Suppose I'm going to do a replay attack, which means I'm going to feed in the temperature so I'm going to change the temperature sensor reading to the temperature sensor readings of, tom of yesterday or day before yesterday. Then, of course, that distribution is as expected because that was from an unattacked situation. So there is no way your log likelihood test will be able to tell you that your system is under attack. OK? Do you see the reason? Because yesterday's distribution is same as today's distribution. Yesterday's temperature distribution is the same as today's temperature distribution. So there is no way for log likelihood test to tell you that yesterday was different and today is different. So that's, that's the problem we are trying to address. In particular, an adversary can always replay the old information to the so, I'm, so the adversary is going to replay. Adversary is sitting here. And it's just going to replay some y of t minus 24 hours. Because it has stored that in the memory. So it's going to replay that. 
And the controller will take whatever action it's supposed to take, not based on the correct information, but based on the past information. And it will never know because log likelihood test is not going to tell him, tell the controller that this distribution is different uh, from what is expected. So how do we solve this problem? So controller has a problem that the adversary could send me information from the same distribution as what is expected and then there is no way for me for the for the controller to check that using log likelihood test it's not able to check whether uh, there is an attack ongoing on the system or not how do we how do you how would you correct that how would you try to come up with a detection scheme to address this problem any thoughts So the adversary is just giving, for example, yesterday's uh, data. Distribution. Right, right. That's called the replay attack. A more sophisticated adversary will not give yesterday's information, but it would just generate this information. It would generate ZT according to the same distribution as, as what you were expecting, but then it's, a, it's not the true information. It's still coming from the same distribution. So you could have replay or you could just have adversary simulate the system and provide you with some different distribution. Not different distribution, different data, but from the same distribution. What do you think we should do? Distribution and mean and covariance is the same. Right, everything. So the distribution means not just the mean and covariance, but all higher order moments as well, because it's the same distribution. So here is the idea that, uh, of course, is, is well known in the legal community. So if I'm signing a document, typically that paper will have some, what is known as a watermark, which means it will have some, uh, like if you, if you hold the paper against the light, you will see some stuff written on the paper. Uh, that stuff is not, it does not affect the readability of the contract, which is the legal language on the paper. But it allows the, so if I'm, I'm the adversary in that situation, I cannot just copy that legal document on a separate piece of paper and pass it on as a legal contract because it would not have the watermark. You cannot, I mean, if you hold that paper, my, my paper against the light, you won't be able to see the watermark, in which case that contract is not really valid. So this watermark idea, which is, you know, you, you put some signature within the paper itself, so there is no way for you to counterfeit that document, is a very old idea in the legal uh, community. And the idea here is very similar to that particular way of dealing with uh, counterfeit contracts. And the way is as follows. The problem is that controller is sending some control command and it's expecting the data to come from some expected distribution. And even if the data is old, because the control strategy had not changed since then, uh, it's not going to have any effect on the distribution of the information itself. So what the controller will do is the controller will add a noise, E of T, which is a noise small noise. Let me call this small noise. It will just add a small noise to the control action. And now it knows that because it has added a small noise to the control action, this ZT or this YT becomes correlated with ET. Okay, so there is a correlation.
between ET and YT, or between the action that the controller has taken and the observation that the system is supposed to provide. <coughs> now this noise distribution is controlled by the controller itself, and not just the distribution, but also the, the realization of the noise is also controlled by the controller. Like only controller knows what noise it has added, the adversary has no way of knowing what noise was added to the control action. And this idea is known as dynamic watermarking. Why is it an active detection scheme? Well, it is active detection scheme because you are actively changing the control action in order to detect the attack. In the passive detection scheme, this noise was not there, right, in the passive detection scheme. And that's why it was, it was called passive. Passive means you're not changing the action. You're not changing the control strategy. You are just uh, looking at the data and trying to figure out if some attack is happening or not. Okay, so that's the difference between active detection scheme and passive detection scheme. It's also a very, uh, using this particular attack, uh, not attack, this, this particular defense strategy or detection strategy requires you to know the plant very well Okay, now of course, if you are running a, a plant for last 20 or 30 years, you kind of know what the distribution you are expecting to see within that plant. So uh, if it is a new technology, so for instance, if there is a lithium ion battery that came into the market just uh, 10 days ago, you don't really have enough data to understand how that battery, which is the plant in that case, how is that behavior? Well. Maybe they have done, maybe the manufacturer has done enough testing to know the input-output behavior, which is the input-output behavior of that particular uh, lithium-ion battery. But you probably need some more data in order to come up with a reliable model of what the closed-loop system looks like. Okay, so I'm pretty sure, uh, even though the manufacturers would have done some due diligence, you still need a little bit more data, or maybe uh, you need to get data in very different conditions. So you want to collect data from Alaska, you want to collect data from Puerto Rico, you want to collect data from, I don't know, uh, Yellowstone National Park, and then you want to collect all that data to understand what the input-output behavior of that system looks like, of that lithium-ion battery looks like. So for newer technology, it may not be that easily done because the system model may not be well known, but for older technologies, this input-output behavior is pretty well known, okay, because operators have that knowledge from last so many years. So you, you need to have the knowledge to understand this correlation between the input that you have sent to the plant and the output you are expecting from the plant. So the model knowledge must be known. So the defender or, or detector knows model information. These are the assumptions. It knows the watermark distribution. So this is known as watermark, ET is the watermark. And the detector, more importantly, knows the realization of the watermark. Throughout the, throughout the process itself. So let me give you an example. Uh, suppose you are driving a car on the road 
and on a highway, and you want to know whether your steering angle, uh, sorry, steering wheel has been attacked or not. So one way to do it is you keep driving on the road, and if something happens, you suddenly discover that you are not able to control your steering wheel, and then you get into an accident. So you, you're not, your passive detection scheme is not really that good in that situation. What I'm suggesting here is that you keep changing lanes every 10 minutes. Okay, so you're driving, you change lanes, 10 minutes later you change lanes again, 10 minutes later you change lanes. So now what you're doing is you're doing active detection. So in any time attack happens, within 10 minutes you will know that an attack has happened. Now of course you want to do it more frequently, let's say you don't want to wait for 10 minutes, then you have to, within a lane, you want to just keep swaying left and right, left and right, left and right, not, not in a deterministic way, but in a randomized way, so that if an attack happens, you will know immediately that an attack is happening right now. Okay, so that's what active detection scheme means, that you have to put in small amount of noise to figure out that you are being attacked or not. And as you can see in this example, you will know if your steering wheel is not working because as soon as it stops working, you will get to know about it. Does that make sense? Yes. So how is it different from authentication? So this is, this is exactly authentication, but this is a physical authentication through actual actuation commands. The authentication signal that you, I don't know, uh, so if you're talking about cryptographic authentication, that is exactly what happens within the channel itself. So there, so this is, this is exactly the authentication, but here you are explicitly using the information of the control system. Whereas the authentication that you would study in cryptography or in the IT security community, that is, it doesn't really make use of your physical, uh, uh, your physics of the problem. It just, there is a message, it gets encrypted, and then later on, if it decrypts, um, if somebody has attacked it, you get to know at the time when you are decrypting the message. So, so that authentication doesn't make use of the physics of the underlying uh, plant. But we are using that information explicitly in this case. And you are right, this is actually authentication using physical signals and with the knowledge of the physics of the process itself. And if you don't know the physics of the process, there is no way you can do this authentication. About this realization of the bottom part, it means like being turned down the Right. Okay, like this is basically the system. Uh, we, we should know how the system behaves uh, right. when we add this one. Right? That's right. So that's what model information means, right? So you know the xt plus 1 equals to ft of xt ut wt. Watermark distribution is the noise of this, the distribution of this noise that you are adding. So that is known, and the realization of the watermark is known. Okay, so the det detector knows all of this. Detector knows these three things. Now what does attacker know? And here we are going to as actually assume that the attacker is very, very sophisticated. Uh, the attacker is not really a, 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 a dumb adversary just changing the, the, the inputs, the attacker is actually pretty advanced and knows a lot about the system. So I'm going to assume that the attacker knows the model information and it knows the watermark distribution. But it does not know the realizations. <coughs> no, it won't, right? Because the realization is in the microprocessor of the controller and the adversary is sitting in the communication channel. It's not on the same, same uh, memory location as the controller's memory location. The two are quite separate. 
the attacker is in the channel or the attacker could be in the sensor itself okay so the attacker could be anywhere in this in this region and uh, it doesn't matter it should not be at the controller place like wherever the controller is residing so if you have a computer and the computer is actually physically connected to the sensor and the attacker is also sitting on the computer then it's quite likely that the attacker can read the memory location wherever con controller is trying to come up with the control strategy or the noise so that situation is is out of question because there the attacker would know what the watermark information is but here we are assuming that things are sort of far apart and the the adversary is not at the same location same memory location or same physical processor as the adversary is adversary and controllers are not in the same processor so to give you an example in this case let's say i there is a temperature sensor there and i put my finger on top of that temperature sensor so i'm now corrupting the reading of the temperature sensor and if i do it for long enough time let's say if i were doing this for 2 hours or 3 hours there'll be a lot of cold air pumped into this room and the room will become very cold so that's an attack i'm launching on the sensor but i'm not physically located with the controller the controller will be in some room within the building right so the other kind of attack would be uh, you have a radar and i'm spoofing your you're you're driving a car with a radar and i'm sitting outside and i'm spoofing the radar by sending some electromagnetic waves on your radar uh, sensor which is typically in a vehicle it is uh, in the side mirror you have like a bunch of radar in the side mirrors and that's how they detect whether there is a vehicle like what's the speed of the vehicle in front what's happening on the side lanes uh, so the the radar typically sits on the side mirror and uh, i could send some electromagnetic signals or interfere with the radar signals uh, so that's an attack where the adversary is outside the system not at the not in the same uh, physical location not physical location but not in the same memory as the controller question no so i'm assuming that the attacker is extremely powerful here the attacker knows the model information now how do attacker how can attacker know the model information well most of the industrial control systems are sold in open markets like i could go and i could buy the same set of thermostats and the same set of building control systems if i wanted to attack this building i could literally go and buy it right now uh, in the market it's going to take me one month to install it and then i can collect as much data as i want to come up with the model information the other way attacker can gather model information is through the uh, what is known as the 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 you know like when you are installing something you get a document the specific spec sheet specification sheet and that specification sheets contains a lot of information this is communi commu this device communicates using this protocol here are the range of readings you should expect this is what the accuracy level is and all that stuff so those things are in, uh, uh, already there in the specification sheet all the attacker has to do is know what's written in that specification sheet and it knows all the model information uh, there was an attack it's not related to dynamic watermarking but there was an attack on target's hvac system and the reason for that attack i mean the way attackers knew how to do the attack was the hvac system had a, a default administrative id and password so id was admin the password was admin and the whoever installed the hvac system didn't really change the admin password and so the attackers knew what the password for entering the hvac system was through that approach okay so so the attacker can know the model information pretty easily now attacker knows the watermark distribution now this is also something that it, the attacker can deduce from the uh, from the spec sheet itself if it is already provided or the attacker was an insider in the in the system so let's say i am the facilities manager for this building and i have been working here for 20 years and university fired me and i am angry at the university and i want to attack this building management system i know the watermark distribution because i was the one who actually wrote the code for that watermark distribution 10 years ago okay so 
So the attacker would know the watermark distribution as well. What the attacker would not know is what the realization, what the actual realizations during the control process was. Okay, so the attacker is pretty powerful. The detector is pretty powerful, but the only thing the detector knows extra is the realization. Okay, that's the only extra information detector has. Okay, so now that we understand the setup, let's try to do some math and try to come up with a detection scheme. And the detection scheme would be as follows, and I'll go over it, but here is what I'm going to detect. The controller is adding this noise, small noise. This small noise will have a significant effect in the sensor output, okay? So if you are driving the car and you are just moving the steering left and right, you can actually get real-time information about whether your car is moving left and right or not. So there is, an, there is an effect of this particular noise in the sensor reading. And what the controller is going to see that whether the reading that it's getting, with whether ZT is as expected as what I would be expecting otherwise. Like, so if I'm, if I'm turning my car left and the car is going straight, I would know immediately that there is something funky going on inside the car. And, and that's what the controller is looking for. So the signature of ET through the sensors. So how do we put that in a mathematical framework so that we can come up with a detection strategy? So let's do that. I'm going to start very simple with a scalar model, and then we will go on to a vector model with a more complicated detection scheme in the next class. So the scalar model is as follows. I have xt plus 1 equals to axt plus but plus wt, and I have uh, zt equals to yt plus, sorry, xt plus vt. and your yt equals to xt, and your ut equals to gamma star or gamma of xt plus et. Oh, did I write xt? Actually, I should make it zt. Okay. So I'm, uh, this is the control policy that I'm generally using, and then I'm adding some small noise to my control action. And this VT, VT is attack, uh, uh, the attack realization. So VT is basically trying to, uh, you know, maybe uh, change the value of XT by a certain amount, and ZT is what is getting fed to the controller at a specific time. So this is the setting. What is the setting like in a linear fashion like this? Uh, I'm just trying to keep things simple here. Okay. Yeah. So there, there are nonlinear extensions to everything that we are talking about. This is coming from a 2016 paper. Uh, there are nonlinear extensions done in 2019 and 2020, uh, but those are like far more complicated because you have to account for those nonlinearities. So it just makes things very complicated. But I just want you to know that uh, the nonlinear counterpart exists for all the stuff that we are talking about. It's just a pretty complicated set of expressions. Okay. 
So let's look at Let's look at how xt plus 1 evolves. So xt plus 1 is axt plus b gamma of zt plus bet plus wt. So this means that xt plus 1 minus axt minus b gamma of zt equals to bet plus wt and so i know these two these two expressions from the model that I know. Okay, let's make some assumptions on the noise and the watermark. So my ET is mean zero variance sigma E square. My WT is mean zero and variance sigma W square. Okay. Now, I'm going to uh, add a small thing that people don't generally talk about, but I'll still, uh, it's not there in the paper, but I'm just adding it from my own perspective. I'm going to call strength of the watermark sigma e square. So somehow the covariance of ET, I'm going to refer to it as strength of the watermark. So if, ET, if sigma E square is large, then the strength is very strong, the watermark is very strong. If sigma E square is very small, then the strength of the watermark is very small. Okay, that's just my, uh, something that I, I'm going to refer to in, in our discussions. What we would eventually say is that if the strength is very high, you can detect the attack faster. If the strength of the watermark is low, uh, you will have to spend a significant amount of time for detection. Okay. So if you look at these two expressions, uh, everything, all the information on the left side is with the controller. The controller knows this information and the controller knows, well, it doesn't know xt plus 1 because all it's seeing is zt and zt plus 1. So uh, if I replace this with zt, then that's what the controller would know. But this is what the actual plant is trying to do at the plant level. This is what is happening at the plant level. Uh, and the controller knows this information, and the controller knows this information, and the controller knows this information. WT is not observed by the controller. So WT is something that both the adversary and the controller do not know, because it's noise on the system. So um, if there are some small fluctuations that are happening on the road, the adversary and the controller, both of them have no idea of what's happening. That's just the assumption. If there is any information that is well known to both the controller and adversary, you can put that in the state description or, or the observation description, ZT. Okay. So here is the thought process for 
coming up with a watermarking scheme. So if, so assume that there is no adversary, no attacker, and zt is equal to xt. So if zt was equal to xt for all time, then zt plus 1 minus azt minus b gamma of zt, this is distributed according to mean 0 and variance b square sigma e square plus sigma w square. And zt plus 1 minus azt minus b gamma zt minus b e t Now can you come up with a detection scheme? By looking at, so this is the truth, this is the ground truth. And this is uh, under the assumption that there is no adversary in the system. Now in this case, as you can observe, in the ground truth, the attack, the defender would not know about this side of the equation. It doesn't know what the, the true realization is. But in the case, in this particular situation, the, uh, the defender knows the left side of the equation exactly because it can co compute based on all the readings that it has gathered, it can compute all that information. So can you try to come up with a detection scheme for detecting whether an attack is happening or not? having known that under no attack case, this is what the true situation is going to be like. So, so far we have learned from our statistics discussion that if you give me a sequence of random variables, I can compute the mean, I can compute the covariance, right? So all of that stuff, we already know how to do it. And all I'm asking is, uh, if there is no attack, then that's what I'm expecting. How do we come up with an attack detection scheme here? So now we know the, the information about the distribution of the unattack system. Right. So if V comes into the picture, then those will change. Correct. So that's what we have to monitor. Exactly. That's exactly right. So this part of the system is, is well known to the defender, the controller. And so the controller is expecting to see a sequence of random variables that's coming from this distribution and a sequence of random variables that's coming from this distribution. And that's what it has to check. If the distribution information is violated by the sequence of information that the controller is receiving, then it means it's, a, it's under attack, the system is under attack. Does that make sense? So the unattacked case, there is no uncertainty in what the noise distribution should be, okay? Under the no attack case. So all the hypothesis test has to set up such that H0 is the data that I'm seeing comes from this particular uh, distribution and the attack case, the alternate hypothesis would be data is not coming from that distribution. And that's what we will, that's how we will set up the hypothesis test. So let me, any questions before I erase this side of the board and write down the hypothesis test?
So we, 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 know, we know the noise distribution. Right. The controller knows the noise distribution, ET. Oh, which? Uh, the oh, board. this distribution. Yes yes. yes, yes. That's known. We know that. Yeah, we know that. But you said uh, the, uh, distribution of It's noise. part of model information. The distribution of noise is part of model information. So model information means you know the state transition function and you know the distribution of all the underlying randomness. That those two things constitute the model information. So you know the A, you know the A, B matrices and you know the distribution of WT and you know exactly whatever matrix here is. In this case I'm using identity or one but you could have a situation where you are only observing some part of the state and not other part of the state. So from here to here, we just have like, uh, here the data that we are getting is the correct value, and right. if there the adversary have replaced the data with the... Correct. So, it, so under no attacker, this is what should be the case. With attacker, this is going to completely change, because that depends on what the attacker is adding to the system. But the attacker is adding, what attacker is adding is Z, right? It's part of ZT. And so this, this so distribution is going to change. No attacker case. Sorry? There, there is an attacker, right? That's why there is So, under, so this, is, this is assuming that there is no attacker in the system. So if there is no attacker in the system, this is what I'm expecting. So I'm going to set up my hypothesis test that if my expectations are correct, there is no attacker in the system. If my expectations are not correct, then there is an attacker in the system. That's how I'm going to detect the attack. Why do we represent this that way? I mean... This part? This part and, and the part below. I'm right. Sorry. So in this case, uh, there is no... The ET is on this side of the equation, so this is what the uh, adversary can see. Right, and this is what the attacker. This is what. So this is the adversary's case, and this is the defender's case. Okay. Right. So no matter how strong the adversary wants to be, uh, this information is not there with the adversary. So only the defender, only the controller knows what this information ET looks like. So we are out of time, so I'm going to continue our discussions in the next class. I'm going to set up the hypothesis test for this case and, uh, and come up with a couple of results about what happens when the adversary is persistent versus when the attacker is not, adversary is not persistent. And then we will talk about the vector version of exactly this algorithm. Okay? The vector version is a bit more complicated, uh, but I'll talk about it in the next class. Thank you for your attention.